let's see. On a scale of what? One to ten? Yeah, I'll give it a nine. Yeah. And you just had your first one. Well, there'll be three. Uh, one in January and January. Why am I in a camera? What's going on here? I don't know what they're talking about when these this Bean Romero thing, because I always found his his conversation intellectually stimulating. You are so even later. <laughs> say what I had to say. Stop taking so long to explain stuff. Just get it done and be up out of there. That's all I that's my best advice. So I wanna welcome everyone to the retirement luncheon for Mr. Marcos Romero. I'd like to give him a warm welcome. And I would also like to introduce his wife, Miss Carmen, and give her a warm welcome. Where did I meet Mark? Uh, in high you school. You are his wife. <laughs> so, if you are here to wish Mark fair winds and following seas, you're in the right place. If you're here to tell him to get bent, you're also in the right place. So you notice that the flyer mentioned uh, getting Romero'd for the last time. Uh, this is the only organization I've ever worked where someone's name became a, a verb. Uh, it has a different meaning for many folks, but I'm really hoping that today you're gonna hear some stories that are gonna explain exactly what being Romero'd means. Wow. <laughs> Good to see you, man. Me too, you too. I'm glad you came. Of course, yeah, of course. When did I first meet Mark? I, uh, probably uh, back when I was in test management, a long time ago. Yeah. He was the uh, RCO section head, I'm sure, at the time, and carried that title for many, many years. So yeah, I won't give away the rest of my speech, because i got to give one today, so I won't tell you more. Mark joined the Navy straight out of high school in July 1979, before maybe some of you were born. <laughs> After graduating from the Navy Air Traffic Control School in Millington, Tennessee, he did tours at OLF Imperial, Imperial Beach, California. Suda Bay Creek, Greece, the USS Carl Vinson in Alameda, Naz Point Magoo, two tours in Magoo, the USS Independence in Yokosuka, Japan, Faxback, Pearl Harbor, Hawaii, and finished off with his second tour as an air traffic control lead, leading chief at Point Magoo. He retired from the Navy in 2001 after serving 22 years. Mark then worked at a cleaning chemical manufacturing plant in Pacoima for six months until he was hired by the Sea Range in November 2001, and the rest is history. That begins the history of being where Uh Let's see, I met Mark uh, in 2005 or six, I think. Um, it's been a while, but... The most memorable experience, I think. <laughs> most memorable. Oh, there are so many. Let's face it, I made so much trouble for Mark, and I enjoyed doing it, and he's gonna enjoy being retired, so... <laughs> Uh, instead of telling him everything that we did together, because I was going to remember that. Uh, thanks, Mark, for all of the help, especially at the end there with all of the approvals for working through and getting RSEs usable and uh, all of the problems you worked away for the range. I really appreciate it. Take care of yourself. Enjoy retirement. And give me a call sometime. <laughs> He qualified as a not to be plead military radar unit air controller in 2002, then as an RCO level three in 2003. In addition to actively working these positions, he served on several committees during this time, becoming actively engaged in Sea Range operations policy creation. In 2009, he was competitively selected as the head of the MRU RCO ATC section. While leading the RCO section, he streamlined procedures and worked closely with test management test conductors, and range safety during planning and execution of PMSR events. He led the way for integration of unmanned aerial systems into the sea range and eventually created the PMSR UAS manager position to provide dedicated integration assistance for these systems. He also recognized the need for and created a training standardization lead position into the section to provide a dedicated, structured, and aggressive training program. Recognizing a need for greater infrastructure in order to provide unrestricted support for any and all combinations of sea range events, he orchestrated the move to the Bravo control room where the RCO and Range Surveillance Center work jointly continues today. Great job, Mark. We appreciate you. <laughs> for the chow. We'll definitely miss you. Oh, boy. I can't talk about that on camera. <laughs> uh, I'm just mad that it was, it we had to wait till your retirement to get food from you. 
Mark, um, there is still a couple things around the office that are a little off offset. I'm gonna need you to come <laughs> fix that. Mark was also the catalyst for creation of the Civilian Rain Surveillance Center section when he recognized the need for greater consistency and standardization of training for these personnel. In October 2020, Mark accepted the challenge and assumed the title of Acting Test Operations Branch Head, which he did exemplary, uh, exceptionally well. He successfully executed this responsibility and managed two new supervisors while retaining the duties of RCO and ATC Section Head. <laughs> Uh, in recognition of these efforts, Mark was presented the prestigious Captain Walden Memorial Award in July 2021. And then just when he thought his headache was over, we had our RSNC section head move to a different job and he took on a third hat, so he was triple hatted, which he also did exceptionally well. And for those of you who know Mark, that's just Mark. How long have you been on Mark? <laughs> 20 years. Is that true? That years. is true, I will confirm that. This is Mr. Years. Keith Renford. Previously, will not confirm or deny. Previous test conductor <laughs> and uh, test uh, ops branch head. Uh, we were just talking about that. I, I think I met you before you were section head. Yeah, you were range safety. Yeah. You were a regular Probably range safety. Probably 15 this years, maybe, somewhere in there. Yeah. It did. It already happened. Meet Craig. Yes. Craig from yeah. Telemetry. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, TM. TM. That's right. How you doing? Peace. <laughs> Mr. Swan. <laughs> How long have you known Mark? I've known Mark, I guess, what, eight years maybe? Yeah, about eight years. It's about eight years. Yeah, yeah eight years? I, yeah, yeah, since I but got into Telemetry. On and off, we used to work next to each other upstairs. Up third in the floor. RCO third deck. Yeah, he's on the third deck yeah. and I was in the tenor room. Although tenor he's room. a retired chief as well, so yeah, it's no. possible <laughs> yeah. our paths may have crossed <laughs> in the past sometime in some <laughs> port somewhere. I don't know about chief, but okay, I'm retired. <laughs> uh, during his tour in the Navy, he graduated from Southern Illinois University with a Bachelor of Science degree in Aviation Management. He married Carmen during his first tour. <laughs> At Point Magoo in 1986, same year that Top Gun came out. No coincidence. <laughs> and has three remarkable daughters, ages 33, 29, and 19. At this time, I'd like to introduce Mr. Kevin Mayhew for a presentation of the black and a command point. And what I have here is uh, our infamous Sea uh, Range plaque. I know I see many retirees that have had this in the past, but for those that don't know, this plaque is unique to this department. If you see a vial of sand, uh, I'm told the sand is from both uh, Santa Cruz Island, Point Magoo, and San Nicolas Island. And, and, and uh, it shows a rough area of the, of the uh, uh, sea range map, which of course, throughout Mark's career, he uh, helped control and manage uh, aircraft and participants all throughout this range. So I'm sure when he looks at this, it'll bring back many, many memories for him. And so I guess a little story, I, I think I first met Mark uh, back when he was just the MRU ATC RCO the section head. Uh, I was probably new in test management at the time, this is a good dozen years ago or so. And uh, Mark was one of the, uh, the, the uh, quiet, uh, knowledgeable gentlemen that probably helped train me in that new job I had. Um, I had not been in range ops uh, division prior to that point. And that, and that job I was in, I was managing the range schedule dealing with customers, dealing with people like Mr. Conley and others to try to coordinate events uh, here at uh, the Point McGoo Sea Range. And, you know, I would I'd be in the scheduling meeting at times and, you know, trying to do something which probably was pretty stupid to most people, but to me, I'm like, why, why can't we uh, do back-to-back -back events with 30 minutes in between and we got to roll a BQM out to 55 and Mark would kind of whisper to me, hey, Kevin, uh, I think we need 90 minutes to, to make that transition happen uh, smartly and wisely. So. Throughout my, uh, my learning curve, Mark was there in the background, quiet, quietly, uh, probably didn't know it, giving me counsel, and I, and I was thankfully smart enough to listen to him because when you're around someone that's knowledgeable like Mark, it's unassuming, that's uh, a people person, mission focused, uh, you notice. And so I noticed, uh, I noticed that of Mark right away. Um, I absolutely appreciated uh, all the conversations we had and all the advice he'd give me. And uh, in my, my recollection of the time, I thought we got, got along really well. I mean, well, he, he didn't always give me good news, but he gave me necessary news, and I certainly appreciated that. And so, uh, and I can remember one particular time, you know, I was so pleased I was able to schedule, you know, concurrent operations, which today we do that regularly. At the time, we didn't do it so regularly. Um, and uh, we had orchestrated to have, I think it was a, a JDF-CHI mission on the inner sea range. 
Uh, for those that don't know, that's uh, uh, one of our foreign allies has a surface -to surface weapon, shoots off the beach here, you know, inter intersects a, uh, a seaborne target out 20, 30 miles off the coast. Mm -hmm. Concurrently, we had a Harmex, we had fleet aircraft coming in, I don't know, a dozen aircraft or more doing a mission out there on the outer sea range. And I thought, hey, this is beautiful. This is the way we're supposed to do it. And I, I remember going up to RCO uh, during that event and, and hearing all the things that were challenges that were being overcome, but uh, it was a, a difficult day for the RCO folks. And uh, Mark basically said, Kevin, I suggest you never do that again. <laughs> And, uh, you know, and I was smart enough to listen and, and I never did. Uh, you know, I tried to push it in other ways, but I, I learned my lesson. So anyway, with that, thank you, Mark. Thank you, Kevin. A lot, but I don't think a lot of him. <laughs> and and, and he's, he's changed my life and he's made me a better person. But then again, I like cold toilet seats too, so. <laughs> You gotta speak, man. You gotta speak. Seriously. And you got something? So, so here's a guy I always wondered. He, every like three or four years, he would ask me for $300. Yes. And I would say, but I still to this day, I don't know. There's got to be a very deep meaning to that question. So maybe someday he'll. No, it, 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 it's kind of, people would, that came from people saying, hey, you look familiar. And I would say, you owe me money. That, that's oh. where, that, where that comes okay. from. That, that, that's an old thing where people would say, hey, that, you look familiar. I don't know you have you owe me money. Yeah. So that's where that whole thing, you asked me for money came from. Okay. I never expected you to pay me. Uh, but if you do. So it's not it. And so uh, last month, the Point Mega Sea Range did some what we call off nominal training. So uh, for those that may or may not know what off nominal training is, basically it's how we can practice and rehearse uh, our jobs in the control room and in our spaces um, in, a, in a training environment. Off nominals are, are behavior or things that happen that aren't planned. And so that could be you know, a behavior of somebody that isn't planned, uh, some, something that somebody does, a system that doesn't behave properly, a system that goes down, or some other uh, unexpected event. And so Mark was one of the trainers um, for that off nominal event that happened last uh, beginning of last month. and. Uh, uh, the Admiral, uh, Admiral Dillon, our commanding officer, uh, he's uh, been focused uh, on safety quite a bit. And so when he heard that uh, the range did a nominal training event, he came out the you know, very next week, a few days later, and, and awarded his commander's coin to the, the trainers and participants of, of that no nominal event. And so I never heard why Mark wasn't, uh, where you were on November 10th, uh, where were you? Why weren't you at the Admiral's uh, meeting? I was at security checking out. Oh, he had pri <laughs> priorities. <laughs> priorities. See, I, I thought he was just burning up sick leave or something. <laughs> so anyway, so anyway uh, uh, he wasn't there that day to receive the uh, coin from the Admiral, but uh, you got a day from me. So All right. Thank you very much. Great. Thank you very much. Real quick, uh, we can now do three complex ops at one time. Good. We're in a much bigger room, bigger space. We've done it, we've proved it. So those days of that incident, I do remember it vividly. We can do it now. But we don't want <laughs> It's fun. You guys love fun. retirement. It, you may be a little bit nervous now, but give it about two weeks and you will have uh, joined the rest of us that are enjoying it. Enjoy retirement. It was great working with you all these years. I know we had a couple of glitches now and then, but uh, it was a great time. So good luck to you and your family. My three daughters uh, could not be here today. Uh, one of them is taking finals up at UC Davis uh, this week. Uh, the other one is working on her dissertation for her PhD, which I'm not exactly sure what that is, but it's a big deal uh, <laughs> from what I understand. And. Uh, the other one is in uh, Puerto Vallarta, uh, waiting for her Colombian fiance to get his visa so they can come back and get married later this month. So anyway, they're not here, but they, I think they're here in spirit. They've all uh, communicated with me. Anyway, my wife is here and uh, Carmen, uh, I'm going to cry now <laughs> already. Uh, the. Uh, the success of my daughters is due to Carmen. So uh, 
I was looking up for I was looking up things to give a re retiree spouse when they retire from a, a job, and it all came up with just military. There's lots of stuff for military spouses, so she did that as well. So she uh, rec was recognized during that when I retired from the military. But I couldn't find anything for today. But uh, she was there. She was there the whole time, of course, uh, since 1986 in the Navy, and followed me around the world doing that stuff. Uh, she moved on her own plenty of times for you Navy wives uh, or military people. I know lots of you are out there. You know how that goes, so it's tough. Uh, she stuck by my side, but not only did she do that, but she sacrificed her own career by uh, taking a part-time job at, uh, in Pleasant Valley School Districts, working so that her hours were around the kids' hours, the girls' hours, so that she could be there during vacations, holidays. She took them to school, picked them up afterwards, and I know that the test conductors, especially right now, have dual working uh, fathers and mothers and it's a real challenge so fortunately I didn't have to deal with that uh, during uh, a lot of my career because she was there for that so uh, she did a lot and it's hard to give her something she deserves one of these as well and uh, this is the best I can do so uh, I've got a couple things to give her so did you want to come up or you want me to just give it to you? <laughs> And one more thing. So Carmen has a hobby. She already has a hobby, and it's uh, Christmas trees. So she she has three Christmas trees at home. There's the regular tree, there's the travel tree, and then there's the other one. Um, oh, maybe two travel trees. Everywhere we go, she started collecting uh, Christmas ornaments from everywhere we go, all over the states and, and other countries and stuff. So anyway, uh, I, feel, I saw this one. It's from Trader Joe's. <laughs> And they say they sell out very fast. There's a sign there that says you're going to regret not buying this. So anyway, uh, this is to add to her collection of uh, Christmas trees. Now you can have four this year. And, uh, and this one, you, it's already pre-decorated for you. Not much work to do. <laughs> okay, so... The day finally come. It's about end time, you know. Um, I'm excited for you, and um, I'm looking forward for us being a couple again and doing things together again. And um, you did a good job, and I'm really proud of you. Um, that's it. Love you. <laughs> At this time, I'd like to invite Mr. Rich Rolniak and the RCO team for another presentation. All right, so a little bit of thought went into this, and you know, if you think that map on that plaque is what you're waiting to see this one right here. Um, there you go, Mark, take a look at that one. Wow. So we didn't want to do the whole traditional people sign and write love letters on, on the on the uh, perimeter, because we were thinking about Carmen, and he's probably going to want to put this up in the living room or above the mantle or something like that. <laughs> she didn't want a bunch of you know, people tagging her room or anything. So um, that's why we went with this. There's a couple cards somewhere around here, I guess, where you, if you guys can write, you know, all your I love you notes on there for them. You probably won't remember who those people are in 10 years. Mark Buddy, best of luck in retirement. You know, stay physically active. Keep those Halloween costumes that you got posted on Instagram. I love it. Good luck, buddy. It says, presented to Marcus Romero for, uh, in appreciation for his dedicated service and commitment to the Point of UC range and in bigger font. Uh, the words Green Range. <laughs> when Mark got the acting branch head job, we were having some kind of a conversation. And I don't know what it was about. It was, you know, he's not going to pay raise or anything along those lines. So I said, so is there anything out of this job that you really want? And he goes, yeah, I want my picture on the wall downstairs. <laughs> <laughs> so I said, why don't you go make that happen? I don't know, who'd you talk to? Um, Admin, I don't know, Lisa, Woody, so, somebody. Yeah, so he, he, he got his picture. He didn't smile. He doesn't look happy. <laughs> he looks extremely perturbed. Um, so here you go, man. <laughs> you can uh, like put that under your pillow and I don't know. This is, this is what I wanted in life. I made it. This is he finally it. made it, yeah. <laughs> um, same, same ball as the president, I guess. So when I moved into the office, I'm kind of like looking around 
<laughs> and he left some gifts. I don't know if this was for me, because the note on it said it came from him. But um, I would have. You, 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 Mark, you, you, you read what this is and what it is and why you left it for me. <laughs> so this was a gift from Scott Twombly. You want the whole story? Yes. Tom, Tom, yes. 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 Tom Dowd is not here, so I, my filter is removed. So uh, some of the old RCOs know this story, that I would go on drives. We, I'd visit my daughter when she was going to Sac State in various places, and uh, I would uh, usually not do this when my family was in the car. So, <laughs> but occasionally, to save time, I would uh, pee in a bottle while I was driving. So anyway, that story did last for a while. Had, had some humor to it. But anyway, Scott Twomley bought me this after that. He was like, hey, don't worry about that. That's what this is for. So you're not going to have to any spillage and things like that. But, uh, but the other thing is dual purpose, because up in the RCO sometimes, so those long watches where you can't get out to go then this is gonna meet that need. So this is dual purpose. So I uh, I didn't use it. I, I swear. And uh, and it's so it's 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 clean. I'm, I'm gonna pass it down to my potential relief here, which will now. I spent a lot of time in RCO. I have never once peed in a bottle. <laughs> But you're getting old! I won't get that old. I have no use for this. I don't want it. So I'm going to give it to, uh, I'm going to give it to Aaron Rummer. Give it to someone young. I go on road trips all the time. I'm probably going to use this. <laughs> that's a little disgusting, but that's okay. Nice working with you, Mark, man. I'm going to miss you. Enjoy your retirement. That's it. I gotta save the rest of it. I gotta save the rest of it. We're gonna do speeches. I remember you guys were upstairs when I first came in. Yeah. I was super. I was telling the story earlier. I was super impressed with how things were. It was freezing in that room. You think it's cold now, but it was like 30 degrees in that room. Uh, and I remember after being introduced to Habiba, somebody sat me down. I forget who it was. Maybe it was you or Scott Twombly. Huddy's here. They're like, hey, you know, three years. We're gonna lose all these old timers here. This is a good time for you to be here. And uh, the funny thing is, you know, 2020 rolled around and everybody left. <laughs> but I do remember specifically being impressed by your breadth of knowledge all the time when we would talk about things. You would always teach me something every time we spoke on something. And I had to get you something, so. It's for you. You don't have to do anything with it now, but it's for you. Oh, yeah. Uh, I'm just doing this now. Do. You can open it now if you want. It's it. totally appropriate. Open it. Open it. Uh oh. <laughs> <laughs> uh -oh. Totally can't be worse than an American male urinal. So. <laughs> it's a fork. It says, I'm done. 2021. Yeah. Nice. Has your name on there. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, and it says Mark on it. Damn. Yeah. Christian, thank you. Wow. Quitter. I mean, happy retirement. Congratulations on escaping. Thank you. Congrats, Mark. Hope you enjoy all your adventures coming up. Don't get hurt on your mountain bike and get after it. Have a good one. First of all, um, Mark, when did you first get to Magoo? 86. 86. Anybody know Mark before 86 besides Carmen? <laughs> okay, I'm the old broad that's known him the longest. <laughs> we have a, a special little, what do you call this? Trophy. Trophy. For Mark that says most extra. Because Mark, <laughs> you are most extra. Just a token of our highest speed of the Mark. Yes. I know you guys got dirt on me, so is that it? That's it. That's it. I got dirt. <laughs> See me later. <laughs> you can take the turkey oh, off of the turkey bread right. and the cheese. Oh man, that's uh, I'm so glad to see him go, you know. Yeah. <laughs> What's your fondest memory? Um, seeing him go. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs>
No, Mark's awesome, man. You brought me onto the range in many ways. Yeah, yeah, I helped. Yeah, yeah. Put in a good word for you. That's absolutely right. And you've only let me down once or twice. But right. Not, that's not more than that. I do my best, <laughs> you know. <laughs> and then I told you to dress nice every day, and you're still doing it. Yeah. Oh, yeah. It's got the tie on. No. No, no tie. No tie. No tie. So I'm sure that uh, some of my close co-workers have also known to see me eating a sandwich at my desk and eating the triangle sandwiches. That's in here. I've been known to purchase a few triangles from the exchange a time or two. And this one's for you, Jane. I don't even mind if it's a tuna sandwich that's been in that container for a few days and the bread's a little soggy. By the way, for supervisors that are here, that are still active, you're gonna get a quarter point per EO credit towards your training, so make sure you watch that. <laughs> so, <clears throat> to continue my personal story, uh, my family moved from El Paso, Texas to Bakersfield, California when I was nine years old. So I went from country and western in Texas to Buck Owens and Merle Haggard in Bakersfield. My time in the Navy was not conducive to connecting with my culture. It wasn't until 2001 when I retired from the Navy and moved to Oxnard that I had a chance to revisit the culture I was from. I had a hard time with several of my neighbors not understanding why I didn't speak Spanish and why my kids didn't either. I tried though. When I perfected my ordering technique at the plethora of Mexican restaurants in Oxnard and taco trucks, many times it would go something like this. Quiero un burrito de chile relleno, sin cebolla, sin cilantro, y dos tacos de birria con todo, y un pobre con todo. The reply that I get half the time is something like this. Okay, will there be anything else? <laughs> like, what the hell? I'm trying, I'm trying, really. So, to add insult to injury, I recently learned from my oldest daughter's Colombian fiancé, that I'm not Mexican-American, or American of Mexican descent, or even American. It blew my mind that, and it took a while for me to understand that many people from Central and South American countries ask the question, what gives you the right to call yourself American we, when we are all from American countries too? And I've told a lot of people this story, and I'm, they're like, what the hell? Because we're American. It's just the way it is. We got it, we claimed it first, et cetera, et cetera, whatever. So, anyway, to them, anyone that's from the US that is of Mexican descent, even if they speak Spanish, is just a plain old gringo. So I'll embrace that and I'll tell you what, I'm damn proud to be a gringo. When I travel to other parts of the countries and Particularly, I'm going to say New Jersey. This happened three times in New Jersey in 2019. I'm often asked, where are you from? And when I answer California, they say, no, where are you from? And I ask them, well, where do you think I'm from? I've gotten answers like Egypt, Morocco, Greece, Colombia. When I tell them I'm Mexican, they say, no way. You're too tall and your nose is too big. So, I've got, uh, today is safety stand down training day, right? So I'm going to continue, you didn't, you didn't know, your, I don't know if you got training planned this afternoon, Rich, but this will be part of that, alright? So, and this is also for the benefit of people like Janet and administrative support, the people that don't do ops, I'm going to talk a little bit about ops as well, and uh, kind of keep it uh, in a way that people can relate. So. How many people have or have had dogs at a backyard with grass? Okay, a lot of hands out there. Uh, for the benefit of those who aren't familiar with part of the job of the RCO and the Range Surveillance Center, I'm gonna share an analogy of how we do it. And I know Tom Dowd's not here so I could say shit, but I'm just gonna keep it professional and I'm gonna say poop instead. So, when it's time to mow the lawn, before you do, you have to ensure that all the poop 
is picked up, right? So poop is the same as boats and vessels, range fowlers. And remove, you gotta remove those things before you mow the lawn. Mowing the lawn is the same as firing weapons. So how many times have you started mowing after you picked up poop and you discover, hopefully before you run it over, that one of those poops, that you missed one of those poops? That's a red range. So I usually, after I call the red range, I shut down the lawnmower, go get a bag and a shovel, and remove it before I can continue. And that's what Christopher Elson used to do when he was in the Navy, and Christian. We'd send the surveillance aircraft back in there to remove that poop. <laughs> so we remove it, remove that poop, remove the contact, call it green range. And to Romero, you even more. Sometimes I pick up poop at night. So when you pick up poop at night, you gotta use a flashlight. And that's like there's a ceiling over the sea range. And you've gotta only, you can't go through the ceiling, you just gotta use your radar, right? So I miss more poops at night. <laughs> Hopefully you're not missing more contacts when there's a ceiling. So I recall Chris May, Chris May, my, one of my previous uh, division heads, make a statement several times that perfectly described the situation. It went something like this. You can ensure that you've cleared all the contacts that you found, but you can't ensure that you found all the contacts. Did I get it kind of right, Chris? Okay. And, and I think, you know, all the rave safety folks that are here can relate to that. Woody, you gotta remember this one. Thanks for having us. Uh, I learned a lot from you. It was fun to work with you. You're an amazing individual and professional, and we wish you all the best in your still uh, undisclosed plans for the future. Undisclosed? And Rhonda? Oh, well, Mark, now that I know I was your work wife, uh, <laughs> yeah. uh, I did enjoy our talks, and I want to thank you for the time you took to teach me the secret sauce. So thank you for everything you did for the Sea Range. I don't think there's anybody in the Sea Range who contributed so much heart. So thank you and you're gonna love retirement. I highly recommend it. So because remember, every one out of five times that I go out there and mow the lawn, I find a, a poop that's still out there that I missed. But be careful. <laughs> Um, so I want to talk about a memorable op that uh, you guys will figure out what it is, and some of you may have even been around to work it a few years ago. Uh, it's we began clearing the range, aka picking up the poop, at around 0800 on a Sunday morning. This stop was taking place in FastX San Diego's airspace, actually, but we had their range for this event. There were so many boats in the hazard pattern, normally we get the names and the number of vessels and keep track of all the fowlers, but this day it was so bad that the P3 was reporting in a 10 to 20 mile box, 10 by 20 mile box, that they would just fly through that and say, they quit calling out contacts, they just said there was about 20 or 30 vessels in the box, and we're like, we, we started to throw our hands up. It was a beautiful fall weekend day with a mild Santa Ana. At one point in the afternoon, we estimated we had over 50 boats in the hazard pattern, and we thought that there was no way we would be pulling off, uh, the SOP off that day. It was kind of like trying to have a picnic in the middle of a dog park full of poop. Basically. <laughs> Funny thing happens though, towards the end of a beautiful day on the ocean, about an hour and a half before sunset, all the pleasure boats start heading back to port. Just when we were about to throw in the towel and give up, the number of vessels started to down, go down quickly. That VX-30 bird was feverishly flying around the pattern, reporting vessels leaving the hazard pattern. The poop was manageable now. We settled back into our stations and resumed the countdown, knowing that our approved launch window and airspace was gonna expire very soon. It normally takes two or three hours to clear a pattern. That day, we had been working that pattern for over eight hours. An anticipated green range was issued and we successfully launched that thing with about 10 minutes to spare. 
And I know several of you know this op. You worked at Dinchek with the church, Mark? Yeah. Uh, I think Mike Hudson recognizes this op as well. So I know that the, uh, the OCRs, the operation control rooms, will occasionally break into cheers and joy after a successful event. But that doesn't happen in RCO. RCO usually says, oh, man, I'm glad we're done with this. But, but this op, this was an exception. There were high fives and cheers all the way around in the RCO space. Yes, have a wonderful retirement. Thank you for all the help. You've helped me, everything you've helped me with all these years, and I really appreciate it. Have a great retirement. We have the one so uh, yeah. I, I want to say, could you Just film this so that way when I fill the paperwork, I have hey, video yeah, yeah, evidence? Yeah. Hey, Mark, there goes your bike. <laughs> Family members in San Jose and Phoenix asking me if I knew anything about that thing they saw in the sky. The thing in the sky made national news, and there were some really cool pictures and rumors all over the internet, all over social media. And the picture that we still have around the range, I think it's hanging up a couple places, is it was taken from the Golden Gate Bridge, and uh, the photo lab did a great job of creating that. He still looks a lot like, like Eric, but he's changed a lot, though. Mark, congratulations, and I hope you enjoy retirement. And it was good seeing you around 53 and saying hey, and going to miss that. Take care. Only eight more pages. <laughs> my so my least favorite and favorite op of all time is the same op. Does anyone know what that op was? Mark does. Robbie, you know what that was? Rich? Yeah, you know what it is. Okay, so that op was Black Bart. Some of you may remember it. It was a planning and execution nightmare, but at the same time, it was a blast to pull off. And Spencer, you saw it from MBBC a couple of times. And I think Rhonda, Benita, and some other folks, you had a chance to go there and watch us do it from the control room. Uh, so that, it was, a, it was a execution nightmare, but at the same time, it was a blast to pull off. It was a lot of fun. We required seven RCOs to work at real time. There was two primary test conductors, Marcus and Robert, and four or five extra TCs to assist. At the peak, it consisted of over 35 land clearance plans, a dozen manned aircraft, guns, BQMs, missiles, jammers, and the icing on the cake was 10, 10 UAVs, unmanned aircraft flying concurrently on the sea range. We don't even do that today, but it can be done. <laughs> Curtis Mobley. <laughs> so uh, the last year has been a challenge, like, uh, Avon alluded to. Uh, in mid-2020, when Rhonda told me she was going to retire early, I literally called her a name, a bad name. <laughs> but it was really a term of endearment. We just could talk that way. Uh, we worked well together. She was a great supervisor. And I immediately realized what it, but I immediately realized what that meant for me, that acting, testing, op, test ops branch head was in my future. Uh, it had its challenges and rewards. I was busier than ever. I established a newfound bond and respect for test conductors being closer to their work than ever before. And I also had the pleasure of working with Nick Martin and Christopher Ellison as they were excellent section heads. I also had my first and last, thank goodness, experience with STRLP pay pools. <laughs> so, uh, what am I going to do now? Uh, last week when I was at work for a day, uh, I, you know, I was asked this question a lot. I and mean, I've been asked this question today. So I have no idea. Who knows? Uh, who really does when they retire? I mean, maybe, maybe there's, you know, there's some folks here. Keith, Rhonda, Karen. Or Karen's not here. I thought she was going to be here. Keith, Rhonda, John, Chris, Benita, Jeff, Scott, Jane. Do you guys know, you know, what you're going to be when you grow up? Have you figured it out yet? Maybe you have. But uh, the last time I felt like this, uh, I was probably 17 years old before I joined the Navy. I didn't know which direction I was going to go. Uh, but anyway, for the last 42 years, you know, this is, there is a silver line to this. Because if, for the last 42 years, I've pretty much been following a path with very few forks in the road. And uh, now there is no path I have to follow, and it feels good. I can go in whatever direction I want. So quick fire answers of what I'm going to do. 
I am going to stay in the local area for at least a couple of years. I don't intend to work, but we'll see. Place your bets with James. Uh, I'm going to travel for sure. You guys know I like to travel. So I'm going to travel for sure. Uh, doing some mountain biking, getting into that lately. Do you think he knows how to ride a bicycle? Mm, I think so. He's, I, he looks like he's a cut coordinated guy. I think he'll do well. <laughs> Figure out some hobbies, maybe golf, maybe a YouTube channel. I'll go consult Todd and my daughter Marissa and get some advice on how to do that. And uh, Oh yeah, and I'm gonna embrace and study this new perspective and relationship I have with my culture, try to figure out who I am. And uh, oh yeah, another revelation that maybe a few of you know that are here, maybe only a couple of you know, that my daughter, Marissa, uh, the one that's in Puerto Vallarta right now with the Colombian fiance that's working on his visa. Uh, so she's planning on getting married uh, this New Year's Eve, the end of this month. And uh, she's due with my first grandchild in May. Oh. Sound familiar? <laughs> August, December, May. Anyway, I hear uh, being grandparents is pretty cool, so I'm excited about that. Um, Steve Jobs gave a very memorable commencement address in 2005 at Stanford University and it had to do with planning your life and how things work out. He said, you can't connect the dots looking forward, you can only connect them looking backwards. As he told his story, he described that his dots thus far in his life had worked out pretty good, even though he dropped out of college. As I look back, I consider myself lucky and blessed the way the dots have connected so far. I hope to have at least 15 good years left and a few more after that, and I will hopefully keep the dots in order. So, time for thank yous. Uh, I already thank my wife, so thank you again, Carmen, for everything you've done for me. The RCO team, uh, thank you guys for all your support. Uh, past RCOs and present RCOs, the young and up and coming, you know, when Scott and Pat left, and Jeff, they were like, how are you guys going to do it? You know, all your talent's leaving. Well, there's new ones coming up, and you guys are here, you're new, you've done an outstanding job. You've uh, taken the challenge and stepped up your game, and, and you guys are awesome. So, you know, all these new RCOs, except for Rich, have only been here for about three years, and uh, it's amazing that uh, they do what they do. So. Yeah. Keep up the good work. Thank you. Um, thank you to the TCs, Nick Martin, all the test conductors, CDS operators, and range surveillance section and teams that uh, I've gotten to know for the last uh, few years. I, I've got true respect for you and what you do and learned a lot about what you guys do in the last year when I was acting uh, branch. Uh, Scott Mildenhall and John Hollingsworth. Scott is the UAS manager, he's done an outstanding job. I used to be the, the guy that knew everything about UASs, the, the top dog, I'd say, for the range, but I was quickly replaced by uh, Jeff Dibbler and Scott Mildenhall when he came on board, Spencer Holloway as well. So anyway, this position is vital because UAS is the future of all kinds of stuff, so they're here to stay. So uh, hopefully uh, doing a great job on that. And uh, for John, he's not here, but uh, with the work that he's done with the Altravs, he does amazing things with Altravs and all the complex ops where we have to overlap these things like a jigsaw puzzle. He does great, great stuff. So I really am on my last page now, okay? Uh, Rich Rolniak, uh, he's been shadowing me for the last... Uh... Okay, I'm choking up for Rich. What does that say? <laughs> <laughs> he's, he's been acting for me when I take leave or when I'm not available. He acts as uh, as section hit and he's very competent and he, he's really stepped up his game and he's awesome. Uh, he's, I, I kind of think of him as a little brother to me in a way and uh, he's the same age as my little brother first of all but anyway. You're, you're amazing, Rich. You've done a great job. You've stepped it up in the uh, training job, and uh, I know you're going to do great as a section head. So, thank you. Um, and there's so many people here I want to thank, but, uh, you know, uh, 
Christopher Ellison, it was great having you be a section hit, uh, running the team while you were here. Jeff Dibbler, you did great stuff as the airspace manager. Uh, James Conn, we left, I was gonna thank him as well. Uh, Marcus, been great working with you. Appreciate everything you've done. Uh, Lisa, Jennifer, uh, the, the bees, what do you call them? Killer bees. The killer bees. You guys are amazing. Thank you for everything. Uh, Brandy, Spencer, uh, Lynn Van, Rhonda, Kevin Mayhew. Thanks, you guys all have, have really helped me with uh, my career and, and what I am today. Um, admin and HR support. Thank you, Laura. Thank you, uh, Janet. Uh, you guys uh, are amazing and you supported me throughout my time in, uh, as a supervisor and manager. I really appreciate it. And in addition to that, the stuff that you, know, you guys Helped to put this together, you two. I'm sure there was plenty of others. Avon, thank you for putting this picnic together. Uh, and then this one, uh, this definitely would have not made the cut if Tom was here, probably. But um, anyway, uh, I was going to call it work wives, but Google says that now you call them work spouses. So there's been a few work spouses. Uh, while I was here, and don't worry, Carmen knows all about you guys, so. <laughs> she, she's cool with it, right? I've told her. <laughs> I thought I told her about it, but anyway. Um, so anyway, the definition, oh, don't leave. <laughs> so, the definition I found on the internet uh, for a work spouse, uh, is a special platonic friendship with a work colleague characterized by a close emotional bond, high level of disclosure and support, mutual trust, honesty, loyalty, and respect. So I've had, uh, I've got a list of four work wives from the past. Lynn Van, uh, did she come? Are you here? Oh, hi Lynn. So you're one of those. You know about Lynn, right? <laughs> Uh, Margie Nava, did Margie show up? Okay, well, Margie, she meets that met that criteria. You know her too. Okay. She gives she gives great advice. Anyway, uh, Rhonda Brooks, Rhonda Brooks is here today. Rhonda, you and I were like appreciate it, and. Uh, Saving uh, least but definitely not last is Brandy Patton. Brandy uh, was across, I'm gonna choke up again. <laughs> across the hall from me uh, for the last year or two. And uh, I, I get to work, hey, hey honey. Hey sweetheart. I, sometimes I sing her the song, Brandy, you're a fine girl, what a good wife you would be. <laughs> Last week, she's like, Mark, I love you! <laughs> that was on a Wednesday or something when the TCs are not there, so we always check to see who's around. <laughs> anyway, Brandy, thank you for everything. Thank you all for all that. Um, so anyway, uh, to wrap up, I'm on the last, uh, last topic here. Uh, the future, the future of the sea range. So, uh, scary world out there uh, for years now. I've declared my top three existential threats, and they are not necessarily in order, but China, the China threat, uh, AI, artificial intelligence, and climate change. You know, I was just driving in today during high tide, it looks like, and the, the uh, lagoon out there was, seemed like it was almost up to the road. So these things are happening and uh, concerning and uh, Hopefully we continue to pay attention to these things. And remember that the sea range in one way or another, we've got a sustainability branch. So we're tied to these things in one way or another. Right? You guys had training on sustainability today, right? So uh, anyway, we're tied to these things uh, very deeply. You know, the China threat, of course, all you have to do is look at the news to see what's happening there. And you guys know what we do every day and we're obviously battling that. Um, need to keep up. Um, you guys make an impact, so remember that as you continue to work here. 
Uh, in my humble opinion, uh, there is a new threat that worries me. Uh, it may not be existential, but it involves a relatively new challenge of a divided America on so many levels. Um, I also believe that the DOD has always been on the cutting edge of similar issues and is usually ahead of the curve regarding the right side of history. So uh, you guys are in the right place and uh, just continue to spread your fairness and uh, equality and uh, open-mindedness to, you know, when you go home and interact with other people. Uh, to the workforce, uh, one thing to keep in mind is when there's frustration with work and policies and all those things where I walk into the room in the past and said, new policy, Ugh, that's FNBS. Yeah, the FNBS, yeah. Uh, try to view the range and the policies from the 20,000 foot level uh, when thinking about why they come out and what the Point Magoosey range does. Ask yourself that if you were uh, the Admiral or Dan Carino or Tom Dowd, uh, put yourself in their shoes and try to see it from a perspective of why we have to do things. Things, you know, a lot of this has to do with scheduling, with policies. Why are we cram so much in? Well, there's a lot of politics involved, and try to keep in mind that uh, things usually happen for a reason. If you get a chance, uh, attend high-level meetings um, and view the process and the thought process behind these things, and uh, you'll learn a lot. So Point Magoosey Range is an awesome place to work. Uh, we have done, and you will uh, continue to do amazing things. Uh, how many jobs are there that you can just either figure out what you're going to do or what you've done just by watching the news and world events? So I'm very confident that the test, test ops division under the leadership of Avon and uh, in my previous branch, uh, are going to do great, they're in great hands and they're gonna do amazing things. And uh, I've worked with Lisa and Kevin for a long time and I can comfortably say that the uh, Point Magusi range is in great hands. Thank you. Right. Is that an odometer? Well, that's something I passed on. Uh, yeah, yeah, it should. I didn't, I didn't think you looked at it. Yeah, yeah. So that's awesome. Do you think Mark would uh, benefit from an electric bicycle? Yeah, he's kind of old now, so yeah. it's only I, I give him another year or two, and then Absolutely. basically he's going to lose his serious assist. Mark, probably he's going to lose a sense of balance pretty quickly. So I would say maybe some training wheels Absolutely. or some sort of sidecar <laughs> pontoon thing. To keep and that's him. from an ORM perspective. Isn't uh, yeah, as a safety officer, I, I'm just concerned about his right. really just his ability to function in society. Absolutely, uh, Avon, would you agree? Absolutely. Yeah, I think I think that's good. CRM I think that's the best assessment, and I, I trust you with my life, so I guarantee. All right, guys. Thank you very much for your professional opinion. Sure. Of course. So who, who's this guy right here? Yeah, who is this guy? <laughs> who's that guy. Put the so, name on Joining your oh, your joining world. Joining the now? club. Hi. How are you? Are you ready for him to be retired? Like some stuff on. Hey, anybody want to thank Mark for the, for the chow? Oh, did you polish your shoes? All right. <laughs> They're the stylish Thanks, shoes. <laughs> so you figure out how to do it. Yeah. A lot of people were just too lazy to do that. Or yeah. I already said it. Sure. I can't say it out loud. We are allowed to speak. Oh. Friggin' amazing. I'm just telling him his life's gonna change. You were just done with this. You just stomped out, and we were all kind of like, "Great, yeah." I think we broke apart. <laughs>